regions like Latin America, other places, are so basically unfair. There are so few people who are inordinately wealthy, so many people who have no hope at all. And it's worse now in Latin America. I, I, I can hardly believe it, but it's worse now in Latin America than it was when I went down there 32 years ago in 1960 at the end of the Eisenhower administration. It is worse now even than it was then, and then it was appalling. The CIA will, in other words, be working with the security and intelligence services of other countries. And one way they're going to be doing it is through high technology. There is a book on the table back there by Ari Ben Menashe. A, it just came out three weeks ago. It is called The Prophets of War. Ben Menashe was an officer in the Israeli military intelligence service for 12 years. And he was involved at the highest level in some very, very interesting things. It is probably the most sensational book that's come out this year, although it is not receiving the proper attention it deserves in the U.S. information media. But uh, Ben Menashe, it's a very long story who he is and the controversy surrounding him for the last uh, two or three years. But one of the things we owe to him is gratitude for having outlined how the Promise software uh, developed by the Inslaw Company was marketed around the world to intelligence and security services. When I was in the agency, I was in charge in two Latin American countries of what we called first the lynx list, lynx as in the animal. The lynx list was a, uh, a series of files on all of the most in, uh, important political activists of the left in the host country. I did it first in Ecuador and then in Uruguay, but all the countries of Latin America, and I'm sure all the third world countries, had the requirement on the CIA stations, which came from headquarters, to keep this uh, list up to date. What it amounted to were files on the individuals, uh, names, place and date of birth, biographic information, in other words, uh, synopsis of the political activity of the person, which was constant, constantly being updated, up-to-date photograph, uh, where the family lived, where the uh, man or woman worked, where the spouse worked, where the children went to school, where they took their leisure activities, where they were liably or liable to go to hide in a period of crisis, all of those things. And uh, some officer, uh, in my case I was a junior officer at the time, I had to keep these uh, different files up to date, and it was all in Spanish for quick turnover to the uh, local police and security authorities so that these people could be rounded up en masse. And we used this information in Ecuador, for one example, in 1963 when a whole series of our operations came to fruition, as they should have, and resulted in a military coup against the elected civilian government. There was a military junta immediately in place, and we were turning over this information, I was, to the local security authorities. That was one of my jobs. And they, in turn, were rounding up people by the hundreds and putting them in jail. Very similar information would have been used in Chile uh, in the aftermath of the Pinochet coup in 1973, and there could be many more examples. In El Salvador during the 1980s, I'm certain that this was done uh, by the CIA with the Salvadoran security forces. Well, what I was doing in the 60s was all by hand. It was before computers, or certainly before microcomputers, and the development of the software uh, to make it all computerized. But in the late 1960s, a man named Bill Hamilton in the National Security Agency developed a program for use in tracking people. And he left the National Security Agency, uh, took over a nonprofit company named Inslaw. You will, many of you will have been following the Inslaw scandal. Uh, and he further developed and enhanced this program called PROMIS. P-R-O-M-I-S stands for Prosecutors Information Manage Management Information System. And he then sold it to the Justice Department. Justice took it, uh, refused to pay him. There was a court suit that followed. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Because what is important is that this program was a development of what I was doing with the links list, or what was later known as the name changed to Subversive Control Watch List. And Ben Menashe writes in his book how the Israelis got this program from Earl Bryan, the former Secretary of Health Services here in uh, California during Reagan, uh, the Reagan period as governor. Uh, Bryan was uh, marketing it around the world. 
The Israelis also marketed, around, marketed it around the world through another private, so-called private individual, i.e. Robert Maxwell, the tycoon who owned the uh, mirror uh, interests in Britain and who later was killed. Ben Menashe is certain that he was killed, that he didn't commit suicide when he uh, fell off his yacht. But in any case, <laughs> in any case, what happens is the Israelis provide this software to the Guatemalan government in 1984. Now, what does this system do? It means that disparate databases can all be made to interface and that the formats can be made compatible through this very high-tech advanced software. It means that for a list of individuals, everything about them can be put into the same computer program, from the water company lists to the telephone company records to the electric company records, all the utilities, bank records, uh, travel records, for example, all the airline uh, reservation systems, trains, buses, everything you can imagine. And of course, the national identity registration documents. In Guatemala, in order to make this work, they got new IBM computers, and they did a new census of the whole country. And they issued a new system of identity card, identity document. Then they trained, uh, they trained the security forces and the army to use a very elementary uh, computer terminal, which they installed all over the country, and in bus stations, at airports, even roadblocks in the most remote places. And this was the period of the greatest political repression in Guatemala um, in history. It was the period of uh, the general Mejia Victores, who was uh, calling himself president at the time. Well, the Israelis and the CIA created trapdoors into this program. Trapdoors meaning a way through modems in which they could have access to the computers of the host intelligence or security service. They tried it first with the Jordanians, and as soon as it was installed through the trapdoor program, the Israelis were reading all the files of the Jordanian military intelligence service. And, of course, the principal target of the Jordanians were the Palestinians, which were the Israelis' principal targets. And so they were able to collect an enormous amount of information by monitoring what the Jordanians were doing through this promised software. The same thing happened in Guatemala. The... Um, Israelis were able, with the CIA, to monitor the way the Guatemalan security services were using promise in the political repression. Well, about five nights ago in New York City, I was with Ben Menashe, and um, we were with my son and a friend of his, a woman refugee from Guatemala who's been in this country for about a year. She's a graduate psychologist who had been working for years with the street children in Guatemala. You know the police have been killing them right and left. There are some 7,000 homeless children on the streets of Guatemala, many of them the children of people who have been disappeared by the Guatemalan security services. She was threatened with assassination. Uh, she refused to leave. Then they threatened her children. Then she did leave. And she was sitting there as Ben Menashe was describing this mid-1980s setup in which there were all of these checkpoints all over the country and the little com the, um, the terminals to this promised software stuff in computers. And, of course, he said that the Israelis knew that as they monitor monitored that system over a period of a little less than two years from the installation of the program in 1984 until late 1986, 21,732 Guatemalans were murdered identified, located, and murdered under the system. Well, this woman, of course, started to cry. The tears started to come down her face, and she began to weep because she said that so many of her friends, the best people that she'd ever known in her life, had disappeared. Even people in a wheelchair, she gave two examples, were disappeared. They just were wiped off the face of the earth and never found again. This is something for the future. It is obviously a development of what I was doing on the links list and the subversive control watch list in the 1960s, but developed into the highest possible technology with computers and software. And this promised system has been sold around the world by the CIA through Earl Bryan and by the Israelis through Robert Maxwell before he died. 
because those two had companies in which they could make it appear to be a commercial transaction, and the buying companies would never know that that trapdoor existed. Well, it was sold to the British, the Canadians, the South Koreans, the Australians, Iraq also. That's by Earl Bryan on the side of the CIA, and by Maxwell for the Israelis to Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Nicaragua, Soviet Union, where they got into the files of Soviet military intelligence in the 1980s, the GRU. Other countries as well. Well, just imagine what that would mean for the United States, for us living in this country. Uh, bank records. Every time you make a deposit to the bank or you draw a check, all that can be put into it. So that it is the ultimate, really the ultimate big brother system that anyone could imagine. And certainly if the United States developed this program, it's, in think it's unthinkable that they don't have it in the system here in the United States to use on whoever, whomever they want to. And uh, I've had experience in the past where I have flown, for example, from Hamburg to Madrid, Spain. It's a two and a half hour flight. And I have tested the system. And I have told no one I was going. I have not made any reservation. I've gone out to the airport, bought my ticket in cash, and put my true name in as the passenger. And two and a half hours later, when I get off in Madrid, the cars are following. It works like that. It works automatically. Once your name goes into the international uh, airline computer system, it pops out if you're on the watch list. Well, that is something that can be applied here, of course, in the United States with no trouble at all.